Hi, my name is Paul Sevilla, Adult Services Librarian here at the Livermore Public Library. Uh, kindly put your mobile devices on silent or vibrate as we begin. Tonight's event is part of the 17th Livermore Reads Together Community Reading Program, featuring the book, The Radium Girls, The Dark Story of America's Shining Women by Kate Moore. Now, it is truly an honor for me to introduce tonight's presenter. She is a nuclear chemist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. She leads the nuclear and radiochemistry group of the Physics and Life Sciences Directorate at, at the lab and uses the National Ignition Facility to generate some of the most extreme conditions in our solar system for high energy density experimentation. She is here tonight to tell us about radium, livermorium, and the quest to create even heavier elements. Please welcome Dr. Don Shaughnessy. Thank you so much. And wow, people that came out in the monsoon. I wouldn't have blamed you if you stayed home and watched it on YouTube later. Um, but thank you for coming out. Uh, so, and thank you for the invitation to come and talk about heavy elements. And um, I will touch on radium because I know you're reading the Radium Girls. And we'll talk about our quest for heavy elements at the lab. And I, of course, am going to mess this up instantly. Now, it just doesn't like me. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. There we go. Um, real quick, this is uh, how I'm going to go through the talk. And I always want to give a little preface of what are elements. And it's not, you know, don't want to assume that people know or don't know. And it's probably been a while since some of you maybe had your high chemistry class. But either way, I'm going to just go through that real quick. And then we'll talk about uh, the periodic table and uh, the new elements that we've created, how they're named, and then, uh, and then we'll touch on um, uh, where we go from there in terms of chemistry. So just to refresh everyone's memory again very quickly, everything is made up of elements in case uh, you, you may have forgot from uh, grade school science class, but everything is made up of some combination of all the elements that are on the periodic table that I'll show you in a minute. And probably everyone at this point recognizes H2O, and maybe they don't even know why they say H2O, but that's because it means that there's two hydrogens and an oxygen that make up water. The air we breathe, believe it or not, is actually mostly nitrogen, not mostly oxygen, but there is, of course, oxygen there too. And um, silicon dioxide, otherwise known as sand, uh, part of making semiconductors in Silicon Valley. And then there's us, and we're the most probably complex makeup of elements that there, that there is. And this is the current periodic table as it stands all the way to element 118. And um, every element that I just mentioned is, of course, on here as well. And I have circled these. And I also, for you, let me see, this is probably hopefully going to be a Okay. Um, here's radium that you're reading about, here's um, your, our H2O, here's silicon, and here's the Vermorium element 116 all the way down there. So this is where we're at in terms of known elements uh, all the way up to 118, which is Oganesson, and that is right up there. Um, so now, let me talk about atoms a little bit, just so uh, you, you, oh, now this is working, okay. Um, so again, I just want to kind of go over a little bit what is an element and what makes up an element and how, how do we define each element that there is. And so every element is made up of atoms. And I like to use this example because it's something that everybody knows about, which is a helium, helium balloon. So in every balloon of helium, there's approximately um, 10 to the 23rd atoms of helium. That's 10 to the 23 zeros after it. Uh, in one helium balloon, and if we could go down and, and really zoom into what a was inside, what we would see is a bunch of helium atoms that were moving very rapidly around each other in the form of the helium gas that's in there. And if we zoomed into just one of these, this is what we would see, a single atom of helium. And all atoms are made up of two main parts. There's the nucleus and then the electrons that orbit it. And this is important for understanding elements in general 
that inside the nucleus we have two different particles that can exist there. There's protons, which have a positive charge, and there's neutrons, which just as their boring name implies, they are neutral. And they are just there to bind the nucleus together. And then surrounding it are the electrons, which are little negative particles, and it's just like in magnets. We have this interplay of the plus and minus, and it keeps the electrons swirling around the outside of, of the atom. And uh, you can see here the, the dimensions of atoms are very small. We cannot see a single atom with the naked eye, of course. And, um, but what we can do is blow this up. And I just wanted to point out where helium is on the periodic table. That's element two. And what makes something that we can see, and so I use this example of gold, because everyone generally knows what gold is. And when we have enough atoms together, then we can create something massive that we can touch or see with our, with our naked eye. And every element, this is <coughs> now the, the definition, every element has, uh, has the same number of protons in the middle. So for instance, gold is element 79. That means there's 79 protons in every atom of gold. At any time we have 79 protons, that means it is gold, whether we have one atom or we have obviously a lot of atoms clustered together. Uh, that's what makes an element an element, actually, is the number of protons in that nucleus and, and literally nothing else. So, we have, <clears throat> oops, so as I said, we need a large number of atoms to make something tangible, and it's related, and I've lost my voice already, look at this, I, I heard it Paul's um, uh, laryngitis, it's catching. Okay, so there's a special number that we use to link uh, atoms and matter together, and maybe you've heard of it. It's called Avogadro's number, named after uh, who else? Amadeo Avogadro, shown in this fabulous photo right here. Um, the number is 6.02 times 10 to the minus 3, 23, so 6.02 with 23 zeros after it. And that number relates the number of atoms to something like mass. And so if we have a gram of gold, which is really tiny actually, if you get a gram of gold, it's very small, it has this many atoms of gold in it, and every single <coughs> atom has 79 protons. So that's how we go from something we can't see, namely the atom, up to something you can hold in your hand or weigh or measure on a scale, it is uh, through just a collection of more and more atoms. And here's gold on the periodic table. It's in what we call the transition series here. These elements in the middle are called the transition elements because they transition from things that are not metals um, into metals. And then over here, we get all the way into gases on the right side. So this is the transition region of the periodic table. And you'll see some other things you'll recognize around it. Here's platinum and mercury and silver is a G actually because of the Latin word for silver. So getting into the history now of the periodic table, um, well, we can actually start with ancient Greeks because the ancient Greeks were the first ones to classify things as earth, fire, wind, water. And uh, they recognized very early that different elements had different properties, which is why they put them into these kind of bins. But if we move ahead in time a little bit to the 1700s, Lavoisier, at that point took what was then the 33 known elements and he classified them based on their properties. So we had either metals, non-metals, gases, or what he called earth elements, which were kind of everything else. Um, we have to jump quite a bit, not quite 100 years, but almost to the 1800s, when then the 62 known elements were finally classified on their weight. And so what they did is they started to realize that things had different masses, and they would start to list things based on their weight. And what they recognized at that time is if you do that, you start to see patterns in the chemical properties. And in this case, with this collection of elements, every eight elements, they saw a repetition of a chemical property. So that's when they started to really think about the periodicity of the periodic table, where things are uh, repeating in their chemical uh, properties. Now really the father of what we call the modern periodic table is Dmitry Mendeleev who uh, again in the 1800s took the elements and he went, took it a step further. He also categorized them based on their mass but he really understood this repeating chemical properties at different intervals 
And so when he plotted the mass of elements versus their chemical properties, he realized there were things missing. And he actually identified areas where elements would later be discovered that at the time were unknown. And this was quite uh, astonishing, as you can imagine. And at that point, they had identified which, uh, which is the, today the heaviest naturally occurring element, which is uranium. And he realized that after uranium, there had to be something else because this periodicity was going to keep repeating itself. So and what's interesting is this whole gap here, these are what became um, the lanthanide elements, which I'll point out in a minute, and then these would become the actinide elements. But this was uh, quite astonishing that at this point, with only 60 elements, they realized they were missing things, and it was time to go off and look for, for these missing elements. Now I'm going to jump in the time machine quite a bit here and take you now to 1945, um, when Glenn Seaborg, uh, who's a Nobel Prize winner from uh, Berkeley, when he took it a step further and at that point realized that when you get down here to uranium, that the chemistry here was behaving differently. And so he pulled out what's called the actinide series and placed it in its own row. And this is actually why he won the Nobel Prize. He is also the person who discovered plutonium. A lot of people think that's what he, just, he earned his Nobel Prize for. But it was actually for this actinide concept where he restructured the modern day periodic table. These are the lanthanide elements that I mentioned before that Mendeleev essentially was telling people ahead of his time that they were there and needed to be identified. And they are also recognized as having a chemistry that's in their own series. So they all behave similarly, but different from up here. And so it is with these actinide elements as well. And at this point, um, if you really go into the history of kind of what I'll say modern element discovery, which is really kind of starting with Glenn Seaborg, they at this point had nuclear reactors. They had very basic nuclear reactors. And they were starting to use those to perform nuclear reactions. And they used uranium, which again is a naturally occurring element, and they started to bombard it with neutrons that come out of a, of a nuclear reaction. And they started to make heavier elements. They realized that this was going to absorb a neutron and transform itself into the next element. And then they could take this one, which became Neptunium, and do the same thing and turn it into plutonium and so on and so on. And so then the question starts to become, for Glenn Seaborg, where does this stop? And, and how far can you go? Understanding that everything past 92 is man-made, where can, where can we take it? And that's exactly, I always forget the slides in here, and I kind of jumped the gun. But at, in the, um, now if we jump ahead to the 60s, Seaborg and his team did exactly that. They started. Uh, putting things into reactors and letting them absorb particles and become something else. The other thing that happened around this time is that the accelerator was invented by Ernest Lawrence, which is what Lawrence the Rumor Lab is named after Ernest Lawrence. He invented the what we call now the cyclotron, which is a particle accelerator. I'll talk about that in a minute. If you ever find yourself in Berkeley, you go up the hill to the Lawrence Hall of Science, you will see the first cyclotron that he created, which is not very big. It's only about yay big. Um, and nowadays, of course, we have ones I'll show you that are very, very large. Um, but they started to use these particle accelerators to have more and more uh, transmutation of elements into new elements. And so by the time we hit 1969, we had gotten all the way up to element 104, which is named rather fordium. And at that point, the question really was, do you keep going? You filled out this row. You knew this row had to be there because of this periodic nature of chemistry. But was there really anything left, was the question. So before I get into that, i got to give you a little bit more uh, instruction in isotopes and radioactive decay because it's relevant to what I'm going to talk about next. So I talked to you about atoms before and an atom is defined as having a nucleus with its electrons and it's those number of protons that tell us what element we have. So this is hydrogen which is element one. It has one proton, no neutrons. It's very, very simple and boring. 
Um, but we can actually find hydrogen where there is a neutron that has been shoved, if you will, into the nucleus. And this is still hydrogen chemically, but it's a different isotope, meaning it has a different number of particles in the middle. And this is called deuterium. And it's actually a naturally occurring version of hydrogen that you will find um, in a certain abundance in nature. Now, what can also happen is that cosmic rays are bombarding Earth constantly as we're sitting here, they're bombarding us. They interact with nitrogen in the atmosphere, and in that reaction they form something called tritium, which is hydrogen that has two neutrons in the middle. And this again is chemically hydrogen, but it has two neutrons. Now, it gets to a point where a nucleus can't hold so many particles because the positive charge, if you have too many protons, will try to rip it apart. Just like if you put two poles, positive poles of the magnet together, they'll fly apart. Same with uh, nuclei that have too many protons. Likewise, if there's too many neutrons, uh, it very, becomes very unstable. And this is what leads to radioactive decay. It's actually a nucleus that just has too many particles of one form or the other inside of it. And so when something undergoes radioactive decay, essentially all that's happening is that some of the particles in that nucleus escape and make the nucleus more stable, have a better number that makes it energetically more comfortable. So for instance, here's our tritium, which again is hydrogen, but it has two neutrons. It really doesn't like that. And so what it will do is undergo what's called beta decay. And beta decay means that a neutron will actually become a proton, and in the process it spits out um, an electron, a negative uh, electron. And when that happens now, because we've changed the number of uh, protons, we've gone from one to two, we've actually changed the element. So we went from tritium, which is hydrogen but unstable, to an isotope of helium, which has two protons and one neutron, and this is stable. Helium-3 is a naturally occurring isotope of helium that exists in a certain abundance. Now if we get to things that are more heavy, like now we're in the actinides, so here's plutonium. Plutonium is very massive, it's got a huge number of protons, and that makes it very unhappy because all those protons are trying to pull each other apart. And so what happens when you have something really heavy is you can actually spit out a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons in one particle that we call an alpha particle. But we, when we do that, we're subtracting these two protons. So again, we have changed the element. We've gone from element 94, but now we've lost two protons. So now we're at element 92, and we've become uranium. So we actually change the element that we have when we undergo decay. The nucleus gets happier, it's more stable, uh, but we've actually transmuted the element, if you will. And so, and I apologize, some of you this slide from eight years ago, and the color scheme is dreadful, and if you are colorblind, I will, I will talk you through it, and I apologize, it's not very inclusive. Um, but what this is trying to show, if you can see the um, hideous yellow and purple colors here, is this is supposed to represent half-life. And what half-life is, is it's the time required for half of our unstable atoms to decay in a given amount of time. So if we have element yellow, um, it undergoes decay with a half-life. And after one half-life, we've transmuted half of these to something else. So that's why now we have half yellow and we have half purple. And if we undergo another half-life, half of the remaining yellows will become purple, and so on and so on and so on. So we essentially have no yellow left. And these can really vary from millions of years. Uh, <coughs> uranium, even though it's naturally occurring, is radioactive, and it's obviously as old as the Earth, because it's in the Earth's crust to things that are less than a second. And it really depends on the makeup of that nucleus. And as I just alluded to, there's a lot of naturally occurring elements that are radioactive. And so here's uranium, and most everything below uranium is, because um, then we come back up here, is radioactive. Some things you may have heard of, um, here's radon. Why do we care about radon in buildings? You may hear people say, oh, you know, we're, we're very concerned about buildings that have been shut up for a long time. Do they have a lot of radon? It's because uranium exists everywhere. It's in dirt, so it's in this building. It's in concrete, 
and it's undergoing decay, and so it does create radon. And if you have a building that's airtight and shut up for a long time, chances are there's radon in that building. Um, here's radium that you've been reading about. And um, technetium is a, is a weird one. It's in the middle of the periodic table. It is radioactive. Um, it's just there for, <laughs> it just is what it is. Um, but in addition, I want to show that some of your everyday items are indeed also radioactive. Um, kitty litter has a lot of uranium and thorium in it because it's made from clay, so there's a lot of uh, uh, rad material in your kitty litter. Brazil nuts, just by the nature of how they grow, tend to accumulate a lot of thorium in Brazil nuts. Most smoke detectors have a very small quantity of an element called americium that's used um, to actually detect the, it's that radioactivity of the americium that if it gets blocked by smoke is what triggers your smoke detector. And bananas have an isotope of potassium, potassium 40, which is just naturally occurring, but it also happens to be naturally radioactive. And there's other things that we expose ourselves to. The cosmic rays I talked about earlier are just high energy particles that come from space and bombard our planet all the time. If you fly on an airplane, you are getting exposed to those in a higher concentration. If you get an x-ray, that's a different form of radiation. And so people often might say, well, oh my gosh, this sounds really scary. I've been told radioactivity is really bad. But you know, fear not, because our bodies have understandably adapted to this level of radioactivity that's around us in the Earth, right? Because things like uranium and thorium and potassium-40 exist in nature, our bodies have adapted to it. So we've evolved to basically coexist with these low levels of radioactivity that you have in your day-to-day -day life. So it's nothing, nothing here to be concerned with. Um, now I wanted to, uh, since Paul told me you're reading The Radium Girls, which is a really fascinating story, um, this whole story about how radioactive materials, when they were first discovered, were not understood, obviously, and so people were very confused about their benefits, their pros and cons. Um, so I wanted to talk about it just a little bit, and you may know this from your book already, but radium is a naturally occurring element, and it comes from the decay of uranium. So here's uranium, and I apologize, this is a little hard to see, but here's our uranium that exists in nature, and it undergoes decay, radioactive decay, and everything after it also undergoes radioactive decay, so everything you see here is a decay, and it passes through, here's radium down to radon and so on, until we get all the way to lead. And lead is stable, so lead is the end member of this chain. And so radium just exists in uranium ores. And so when you find, over time, there have been mines where they have found high concentrations of uranium ores. There tends to be a lot of radium and these other elements associated with those ores. And so this is a naturally occurring element. And so, of course, um, you may know the story that uh, the Curies, Marine Pierre Curie, were studying pitch blend, which is the, <clears throat> the generic name for um, uraninite, which is a uranium ore. It's a mineral, naturally occurring. And while they were studying pitch blend, they realized that if, as they did, did various chemical separations on it, they were seeing different chemical properties emerging, and they realized that there were different elements. That it wasn't just oops, that it wasn't just the uranium that they were studying, but it was uranium and its decayed daughters. That we call it in radioactivity. It's always a parental um, association. You have the parent, you have the daughter. I don't know why there's no sons in radioactivity. It just is what it is. Um, but they realized that in pitch blend here there was several different elements, and so they really worked to isolate and try to identify all these different elements. And they identified radium as being different based, again, on its chemical properties, and this was reported to the um, French Academy of Sciences, and then they did a lot of study with radium, and at the time, not quite understanding that radioactivity now in large concentrations is not healthy for the human body. They didn't really understand that at the time. They started to use it quite a bit in different applications. As you read in the book, it can be used in luminescent paint. So this is where it led to painting um, 
watch dials with radium paint because it would glow. It's also very interesting if you read uh, about radium in general that they used it in a lot of beauty products. There was this thing called radium water where there were uh, hot springs, where there was some concentration of radium in the hot springs, and people would go there to bathe in these waters because at very low concentrations, radioactivity can um, you know, would, would give them some, I don't know, artificial glow or something, not, not a glow in the dark thing, but you know, it would, it would you know, their skin, it, what am I trying to say? When you're um, exposed to a little bit of radioactivity, not the naturally occurring stuff we see every day, but you know, if, you, if you're exposed to a higher concentration, your skin would naturally kind of slough off a little bit and would expose new skin underneath. You know, like nowadays, women exfoliate. This was sort of like that, but in a bad way. Um, they put it in beauty products like creams because it would, again, make the skin very glowy and, and slough off. Um, and very early, they did identify that radioactive materials could be used as cancer treatment. The problem is back in, in the days of the Curies, they didn't have, of course, the technology we have now. So what they would do is they would introduce a large quantity of radioactivity into someone with cancer. And it was really a, um, a crapshoot whether they would survive the radioactivity itself that could then kill the cancer. And then naturally, that has improved, thank goodness. Um, Radium is often blamed for Marie Curie's death, although you could also attribute it to polonium and all the other elements that she studied in the pitch blend, but she did end up dying of, of a cancer. Um, but here's an interesting thing. The historical unit of radioactivity, we use a little bit different unit now, but historically it was called the Curie. And the Curie was actually defined against radium. So one Curie was defined as being the amount of radioactivity in one gram of radium-226, this specific isotope. And there would be little ampules of radium that were used uh, by the um, National Bureau of Standards to basically quantify radioactivity. Now we use a unit called the Becquerel, named after Aubrey Becquerel, uh, but some of us old timers still use the Curie because we're creatures of habit. So now let me move into the next part, which is talking about new elements and how do we get to elements now beyond Glenn Seaborg's 104 and why do we care? And why do we think that there would be more elements beyond 104? Um, so now I'm going to show you this map of the elements, that this is also a Glenn Seaborg uh, drawing and uh, in the late 60s. And this is, you know, at this time they had up to element 104, rather fordium. And now that you're experts in nuclear science, you know that the nuclei have neutrons and protons. And what I will tell, and what I told you that things that are have too many of one or the other become radioactive and unstable. But we also see the opposite, where there's an ideal number of neutrons or protons. We get things that are incredibly stable, meaning that they will never undergo any kind of act radioactivity. And we see these at certain numbers, that being 28. 50, 82, and 126. And if I scoot ahead one, these correspond to proton numbers being nickel, tin, and lead. And these are all metals. They're very stable metals. They can be used for a lot of applications. They're very hardy. Um, and it's because they have what we, these special, what we call magic numbers of protons, if you will. And what I talk about here is I mentioned um, shells. So if you think about a nucleus as being like your cabinet in your kitchen, just like you would stack your cups and your plates a certain way, so it goes with neutrons and protons. There's only a certain number that can fit in any given energy level. So you stack up your protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and they have different energies. And when you get your full cabinet, you shut the door and you move on. That's how it goes with protons and neutrons. They want to fill up their shell. That will give them extra stability. And then they don't want any more particles in that nucleus. They're done. So that's why these things are metallic and they're very strong and very durable materials. Okay. Now, this picture is very cute um, in that what Glenn Seaborg was showing is get to lead, and we all knew that lead was incredibly stable, especially if it has 126 neutrons in it. 
And then here's where you get the, those actinides, which is uranium, on up now to element 104. But now what this shows you is there's got to be something else, right? Once you pass 82, there has to be another energetically closed shell of protons. And the question was, where was it? And if you just look at theory, the theorists would say it should occur around element 114. But those of us that are experimentalists say theory is great, we want to test things. So we went off and, and scientists went off to test where this could be. Okay. Now how do we, so how do we do that? Okay, it's very easy, as <laughs> you can imagine. So we want to make elements in this row moving up from Rutherfordium. So we just add the protons together. As I told you, it's all about proton number. So if I have calcium, for instance, which is element 20, it has 20 protons, and I have curium, which is named after Marie Curie, and this is element 96, I would get livermorium, 116. So if I can find a way to mash a calcium and a curium nucleus together, I would get a nucleus of element 116. And we just so happen to have an instrument that does that, and it's called a cyclotron or particle accelerator. And as I said, the first cyclotron that was made is probably a foot across or less. This is the one that we use in our collaboration, making element 116. And so how does this work? You have two gigantic magnets that are in the shape of the letter D, and you have a source in the middle that makes ions, okay? What is an ion? It's just an atom that's missing some of its electrons, so it has a charge, okay? And so what those ions, because they have a charge, you can apply voltage to them. And if you alternate the voltage through these magnets, it will start to move and it will start to spin around. And I don't want to make you all dizzy, but you get the idea that eventually the particles will move to the um, diameter of this and you can actually withdraw them. And the key is as, as you go around with that voltage, the particles gain more and more and more energy until you're at some small fraction of the speed of light coming out in the form of a particle beam, okay? That's the easy way to explain a cyclotron. So there's our ion source. This is where our target would be that the beam coming out would hit the target. In this case, think of the target as our curium, and the beam is at calcium coming out. And just for reference, here are people, so you can see that these are monstrous machines that live in monstrous uh, giant rooms. So here's the actual curium target that was used to create Livermorium, and what you're looking at is there's very thin foil around the outside of this wheel, <coughs> and there's curium that has been electrochemically deposited on this thin foil. And we spin the targets because the beams are coming out with such high energy, they deposit heat, and if we don't spin this, we can't dissipate the heat, we'll burn out this target. And because curium is itself man-made, there's not so much of it to go around, so we have to be very careful with our target tree and our, our target material. Fun fact, Marie Curie, first woman to win the Nobel Prize in 1903, was not allowed to receive it because women were not allowed in the, in the hall where the Nobel Prizes were granted. Her husband, Pierre, had to accept it on her behalf. She did win a second one later, and she was able to accept that, but um, can you imagine not being able to claim your own Nobel Prize? So thankfully, things have changed a bit from there. So here's um, our colleagues. Um, I forgot to even mention that the cyclotron that you saw is actually located at the Flareoff Lab for Nuclear Reactions, which is in Dubna, Russia. And these are our colleagues that are putting that curing target into the cyclotron, getting ready to bombard it. And what happens after we do that? So here, oops, here comes our beam of calcium ions that we've accelerated through the cyclotron. They're going really fast. They hit our target. We then use a series of magnets to separate what comes out and try to get them to fly to our detector. And the detector here, coming back to my first slide, these are silicon strips. They're semiconductor strips. And what we do is we allow the particles that we make after they fly through these magnets to embed themselves in the silicon here and they undergo radioactive decay because these things are all unstable. And those particles that come out, the alpha particles that come out, we can detect them electronically every time one happens in this detector. So that's essentially what we're looking for with a heavy element. 
And this just shows you the Livermorium chain. So when the calcium and the curium first fuse, we get an element 116 that has um, an atomic number of 290, sorry, an isotope number of 296. This is itself unstable, so it spits out a few neutrons just for fun in the beginning, and we get to uh, um, isotope number 293. But these are all very unstable because they're all very massive and have a lot of protons. So they start to undergo alpha decays, and they transmute to element 114, 112. When it gets to element 110, it's energetically here more favorable to split apart into two, which is fission. So what we're looking for in this detector is actually a sequence of these things in short time, because look at these times. This is milliseconds, this is like three seconds, this is 29 seconds, and this is 11 seconds. So in a short amount of time, we're looking for three alpha decays followed by a fission. That's the mark of a heavy element because we only make one at a time. So we can't use our old analogy of having something we can weigh or touch. We only make one, and so we have to look for these uh, decay sequences. And it's a very low probability of success. Just to, um, I, I have to give credit. I stole this slide from a colleague back when I was in graduate school, and I've used it ever since. Um, she was a much better artist. In those days, we didn't have PowerPoint. It was like paint or something. Uh, anyway, I digress. Here's uh, calcium coming in. Here's one of our um, uh, curium targets, atoms, that's sitting here minding its own business. The calcium would come in and we would hope that they would fully fuse, and if they do, that becomes a livermorium, which we can detect. The problem is this does not always happen. Most of the time, in fact, this does not. The calcium might graze here, because this is positively charged nucleus, this is a positively charged nucleus, so even though this guy has a lot of energy and wants to come in hot and fuse, it might just graze, they might exchange some particles. They might come together briefly, but not all the way, and then split apart to something else. So you can see here, if we start with 10 to the 18 calcium nuclei to start in our beam, at the end we get anywhere from, well, hopefully not, but we sometimes get zero to maybe three atoms. And these experiments go on for literally months, months of beam time. These beams run 24-7 out of the cyclotron, and um, really and, and after several months you might start to see a few of these come out. It's very high patience, high reward experiments. So what does it look like since we can only make one? This is my favorite version of the periodic table because it shows actual elements and what they look like and for radium here they did use a, a watch face which I think is very cool and for the man-made ones they put who or what it is named after and here is our lab. Uh, more sort of more lab symbol. Um, so how do we know we have one when we make it? Well, we get a ton of data because again, this stuff runs for months, and we're constantly getting readings in those detectors that are not necessarily what we're looking for, and we get lists of things coming out. But then, thankfully, we have some of the world's fastest computers over at the lab, and we can look for those trends, those decay chains, where something is decaying into something else in the right time, in the right sequence. And if you can see the, the shading here, what you're looking at is actually, this is for element 117. This was an element 117 atom discovery, um, having these things in sequence in this particular set of data. And so that's what we look for. Okay, if this works, and I hope it does, this is a little video that um, the lab made that shows what I just said much better than I said it. And um, it's very short, but I think um, it's, it's very effective to demonstrate. So if I can get it to work, let's see. Oh, there it was. The discovery of element 116 took place in the year 2000. A target made of the element curium is emplaced in the U-400 cyclotron at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, Flareov Laboratory of Nuclear Reactions in Dubna, Russia. Calcium ions are accelerated at high velocity toward the target of curium atoms. <clears throat> Calcium ions bombard the radioactive curium target in the first experiment for about 90 days. 
As they approach the target, only one of billions fuses with the target to create element 116. At this point, the newly created element 116 travels through a separator and stops in a detector. A total of about 30 atoms of element 116 have been produced at Dumna, and several atoms of element 116 have been produced at GSI in Darmstadt, Germany. At the detector, element 116 decays to heavy element 114, to heavy element 112, and so on. Finally, the nucleus fissions, ultimately splitting into two lighter elements. In May of 2012, culminating over a decade of research, element 116 was named Livermorium, honoring the many U.S. scientists involved in nuclear chemistry and super-heavy element research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the city of Livermore. Element 114 was named Flerovium, honoring the Flerov Laboratory of Nuclear Reactions and its namesake, Gheorghe Flerov. Oh, I love when that video works. It's so awesome. Okay. Oops. Now, they mentioned GSI and Germany in that video. Obviously, to make these requires several things. You have to have the material to make the target. You have to have the cyclotron to produce the ion beam. And you have to have the time, months of time to do this. So where, where has this been done? Well, in the beginning, it was all about the Bay Area, um, up at the hill at um, what was then called the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory in Berkeley, where uh, they discovered elements 93 to 106. 106, incidentally, is named Seaborgium for, um, for Seaborg, who's the one that really spearheaded this effort very early on. Once they got here, what happened is things kind of moved over to Germany at the GSI lab where they had a different kind of particle accelerator. It's actually a linear one. And they used a different kind of reaction there where they used lead targets and they bombarded lead targets with a variety of different beams. And they were able to go from element 107 all the way up to element 112. Then uh, Japan got in the game of doing this, and they discovered element 113. And oh my gosh, this experiment, this was a year. This was a year to discover um, element 113 at this accelerator. I mean, talk about persistence of dedication. That, that's just amazing to me to this day to talk about that. And then elements 114 and 118 here at the Dubna lab in Russia. And um, I know things you know, at this time are a little different than they were back here with Russia, but um, at the time we had a very outstanding relationship with the scientists at the Flareop lab. I myself have been there, um, I've lost track of this four or five times, and they were just very dedicated to these experiments. And as the video said, back in 2012, the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry granted the naming rights uh, to the Flare Off Livermore collaboration for elements 114 and 116. And this was a big deal because for an element to get named, there has to be an independent confirmation made at a different institution. So if you think about that, we're basically asking one of our competitors to put aside months of their own experiments to try to repeat something someone else did where they get less credit. I mean, they get credit from us for doing it, but um, it's hard to get confirmation of these things. But luckily, um, confirmation was done at GSI and at Berkeley, and so we were able to name 114 and 116 at the time, and since the rest of these have also been named as well. Now, what's interesting is there is a public uh, um, comment period that IUPAC opens, so if people now come up to me and say, boy, I hate these names, I say, did you go to the public comment period and express your concern with these names? Um, and I get the look, but, it, but they always do that, so it's <coughs> no one to blame but yourself. So this honors, this collaboration started back in um, 1989, which if you think about it, is really amazing because that's when the Cold War was still happening, and scientists from Livermore Lab um, it was most notably uh, Ken Moody and Ron Lohe went to do that at a time when the Cold War was still happening to do those first experiments. And they have all sorts of stories and tales from that. 
of course. But that was pretty incredible to have this kind of collaboration um, go on, and it went on for many years up until a few years ago. Okay, I'm here the other name, um, here the other naming rights. Um, Japan has 113, and our collaboration since has been given uh, 115, 117, and 118. And here they are, Nihonia, Florovia, Moscovia, Livermorium, Tennessee, and Oganesan. This is for Yuri Oganesian, who is the head of the uh, Dubna collaboration. And the, the kind of modern day Russian seaboard, if you will. Tennessee is in here, so I'll talk about this one. Um, at the Oak Ridge National Lab is where they produced the material that uh, was used to discover 117. And so that's why they um, got naming rights for Tennessee in there. And uh, it, boy, I need a new picture. This is when they dedicated um, Livermorium Plaza in the dedication ceremony. Now, of course, there's a whole nice plaza there. If you haven't been there, it's very nice. Um, right next to Pete's Coffee, so you can get your coffee and sit on the bench, and there's the, the big journey ball that uh, <laughs> it rotates in the middle, but no, it's a very nice pause, I gotta, I gotta update this, but um, it's really nice that it just so happens that 116 South Livermore Avenue is actually the address of this plaza. <laughs> okay. Now, let me real quick with my remaining time talk about chemistry, because this is a periodic table, and even though we use nuclear reactions to get there, we have to talk about chemistry, because that's what this periodic table is all about. So, as I said before, up to 92 are naturally occurring. Elements 104 to 108 have longer half-lives, which means we can actually study them chemically a little bit easier, because we make enough at one time that we can do some real chemistry on it. And so we think we understand the chemical properties of these, and they're very similar to what you would expect going down these columns of the periodic table. Um, we didn't always expect that, though, because these are so massive, they have so many protons in the nucleus, that they actually start to accelerate their surrounding electrons to relativistic speeds. Yes, E equals mc squared, that relativistic speed. And when that happens, you actually affect the mass of the electron, and that can affect chemistry. So the question was, if we go down these columns, which normally would have very similar chemical properties, do we see the same here? Do we see an inversion? Do we see something totally different? Here it's actually pretty standard compared to their neighbors in the periodic table. We don't know anything about these guys, and mainly it's because their half-lives are getting way too short to do any kind of real chemistry on it. Um, so what do we do about that? Oh god, I hate this picture. My hair tonight has been that color over here. Um, but anyway, what we have to really do is chemistry on a single atom. And so we would make something in the cyclotron. Once it comes out of that separator, we would then have to do some rapid chemistry on it, some chemistry that informs us of its properties, namely how does it extract in a certain compound, how does it behave if we put it out a certain temperature, um, a variety of things we can do, and but we have to do it before the half-life. So if something gets short, we may be doing chemistry literally every minute or less, and we have to maybe do this for weeks at a time. When I was in graduate school at Berkeley, we had a, a very fantastic automated system. It was called Graduate Student, where you sit there and like literally do this, like with a pipette, once a minute, all night long, and think, why have I made these life choices? Um, nowadays, thankfully, we have real automated chemistry systems, and that's what we're working on at Livermore now in terms of heavy elements. It's not so much in the discovery anymore, but really looking at the chemistry and can we automate the system, and how do we do chemistry on a, on a single atom. And my uh, colleague John here, thankfully, has a great idea, and what he's is trying to do is he's using these different molecules, these um, what we call crown ether molecules, where the idea is if you make one the right size, a single atom of something like 114 could fit inside one of these and then we could detect it. And if we could detect it inside a certain molecule, then we could say something about its chemistry. Say, well, it interacted with this crown ether which has oxygens, or this one which has sulfurs, and this is very rapid. So John has shown that these things can absorb a single atom of something very quickly. So, 
with the right atom, and he's working with the synthetic chemists on site at the lab to come up with what is the right molecule here. With the right molecule, we might be able to get to something like L-112, or even L-114, which is three whole seconds that we have to work with in L-114. And it would, whole thing would have to be automated, right? Beyond human capability, it would have to be uh, produced and undergoing its chemistry as it's moving to the detector. So that's what he's working on right now. And then I get asked inevitably, well, what happens after that? You do chemistry and you get chemical properties, and that's really cool, but you know, what's really in the news is the discovery. So how do we push up beyond where you are now? Um, and the answer is, I, I'm not personally sure because we're at very short half-lives, so even though we're not doing chemistry and discovery, 118 had a half-life on the millisecond, less than a millisecond time scale. The electronics can't keep up at some point with the, with the decay times of these things. So there has to be difference. You know, a lot of the, like, in the old days, a lot of analog stuff, everything's going digital, of course, um, but you need to have everything fast enough in the electronics to record the signal. The probability, I showed you a very tiny probability, as we get heavier and heavier, we have more protons in the system, and so the probability of making something new is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the experiments will be, you know, the, the Japanese are trying to get to, everyone right now is trying to get to 120. They're kind of skipping 119 because the even ones are a little easier to get to than the odd ones. And, you know, it took a year for them to do um, 113, so what is it going to take to get to 120? It's, it's going to be a very long time. And then there's target material. So there's two different, as I said, two different ways to do this. What we did in our Dubna collaboration is we always had the beam of calcium and we would just change the target and make it, you know, different materials to march up the periodic table. But once we kind of got up to Berkeley, which is what we used for 117, and then California, which is what we used for 118, we kind of run out. The next logical thing would be Einsteinium element 99. There's not enough Einsteinium to make one of those targets. There just isn't enough because, again, these are, themselves are man-made elements. So we're running out of materials. Um, likewise, in uh, Berkeley and in Japan, what they're trying to do is more of having uh, targets of something else other than an actinide and then change the beam. And so Berkeley's working on titanium beams right now. Uh, so people are working on it. There is, I don't know if it's a race to 120, but there are different groups working on 120 right now. So it'll probably happen someday. When? I'm not, I'm not sure. So uh, to sum up, what's in the future? More intense cyclotrons. The Russians uh, have built a new operator <coughs> called the Super Heavy Element Factory. And um, the sad thing is that it kind of came online you know, right around the time that our relations with Russia have deteriorated. So um, they're doing stuff with it, and we're, we're not involved in that anymore, unfortunately. Um, new beams, like I said, Berkeley is developing new beams to use. Um, calcium, we know how to do titanium, we know faster detectors, faster electronics. And then the chemistry. Chemistry on a chip, it's a very kind of buzzword thing to say, but in this case it's legitimate where you have those molecules I showed you, like on a semiconductor chip, and you just are going to flow your one atom over it and hope you see something at the same time it does chemistry. So that's what we're working on. And um, if you get this reference, it means you're kind of geeky like me, and you <laughs> watched Iron Man 2, and it was so easy for him to make an element. He just went in his basement and like wrenched something together, and he made an element. Uh, it's not that quite that easy in real life. So, um, want to show you what it takes to do these experiments. This is the team that discovered 117, Tennessee. Um, all the people from all the institutions. Um, this was a few of us from Livermore at the time. Um, but you can see just this enormous number of people and students and postdocs and professors and, and all sorts. And that's it. That's my whole talk. So thank you very much again for coming out in the rain and letting me ramble on about one of my favorite topics to this evening. And if you have questions, I'm happy to take questions too. Thank you to uh, Lawrence Federal Board National Lab and of course Dr. Shaughnessy for a wonderful presentation. And yes, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hands. Don't be shy.
I know people tell me I'm very scary, so uh -huh. I will try not to be scary. Yes. What What does all this experimentation discovery teach us um, outside of just building the elements themselves? Oh, great question. So, of course, we're in a regime where things are radioactive and decaying, so it's not like we're going to see some real practical, you know, like put it in a thing and do something with it. This is getting into the regime of actually theory of the universe and matter, because original theories about matter dictated that we would only get to a certain element, and we way beyond that, so they had to change basically how they thought about nucleus and, the, and matter. Originally, they kind of imagined it like a drop of liquid, and if you do all the calculations surrounding a drop of liquid that has protons in it, you, you will never get to elements that we have, even in, in the actinides. So uh, what it forced them to do is rethink into this more shell model that I was talking about, where now the, nu the neutrons and protons are kind of going up into energy levels. And as we try to push out, what we're really looking for is that next magic number, right? Where is that next very stable element? And is it at 114? Um, didn't talk about that too much here, so let me just quickly comment on that. We don't have enough neutrons in the system yet, so it's not just 114 protons, it's how many neutrons we have. And we just don't have enough in our system, but we are seeing longer half-lives. So if you trace from going from 110 to 112 to 114, 112 is much shorter than 114, and then after 114, it plummets. The lifetime really drops off. So we think we are seeing kind of the edge of that region of enhanced stability. So all of these things go into what the theorists use to model the formation of matter in our universe, um, formation after the Big Bang, how did matter become what it is? How does matter exist? And that all sounds very esoteric, but there's people that are working on those things right now, and this type of data and this type of information gets fed into those models. And so that's really what it's informing is our understanding of the universe, which sounds very out there, but it's a, it's a real thing. How would you explain the difference between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion? So fission is when you have something heavy that splits into two things. So for instance, most people are familiar with um, like a nuclear reactor. So what a nuclear reactor does is it takes uranium and it bombards it with a neutron and each uranium will split into two things that are smaller. Fusion is completely the opposite of that. What you're doing there is you're taking two smaller things and you're fusing them into something else. So for instance, at the National Ignition Facility as they're talking about that they gained ignition because of fusion, Really what that reaction is, is it's that deuterium, so it's an isotope, two isotopes of hydrogen that combine together, a deuterium and a tritium, which combine to form a helium, and that's fusion. So it's the difference between splitting apart or bringing back together. Uh, so uh, as we learned from the book, Radium Girls, you know, safety is paramount when handling radioactive materials. So, at the lab, what sort of uh, safety precautions are, are there when you, for, for uh, lab workers working with it? Great question, because things have changed, of course, thank goodness, you know, from the days of Marie Curie basically working with stuff with her bare hands. Um, what we have now is, um, what we use is called PPE, Personal Protective Equipment. Everything at the lab is an acronym, so I have to remember what all the acronyms stand for because we're using so frequently. Um, and so what we might do is it really depends on what we're working on. So if it's something that's very low level radioactivity, like uranium, naturally uranium itself is not uh, very radioactive. And so what we might use there is we always have gloves, we wear safety glasses so that the decay particles can't affect our eyes. Um, we would wear a lab coat over our clothes, and that would be for something very mild that doesn't really have much radioactivity, and it would be in a confined space where there's um, proper airflow out the building away from us. And then that moves to something called a glove box, where if we have a much higher amount of radioactivity, it's just what it sounds like. It's a box that has two gloves. You've probably seen these in the movies, right? Or these. You know, they try to make people look like they're scientists. They put them in a glove box, but, but those are real, and it's so we put the material we want to handle in there, and we don't touch it. We have 
We still wear our gloves and our glasses and our lab coats and sometimes even a secondary, um, very attractive, you know, one-piece uh, Tyvek suit. And we might tape our gloves to that Tyvek suit so that we don't have any exposure. And we put our hands in the glove box and we're never touching the material. We still have to be careful though because the radioactivity, if it's high energy, can penetrate the gloves. So then we also use what we call time, distance, and shielding. So we minimize our time, we maximize our distance, and we maximize our shielding, how much is between us and the radioactivity. The highest level stuff, we actually don't do at Livermore anymore. They used to in the old days and they did away with it, but there are other national labs that still have it. These are called hot cells. And this is where there's so much radioactivity that they use remote manipulators. So essentially two claw arms that come in and do all the work for people that then stand at distance with these uh, pneumatic manipulators. And this is a dying skill because it's something that we just don't have to do so much in this country anymore. But when you see these pictures of these people that used to do it, it's amazing that they could do the littlest manipulations in chemistry with these pneumatic hands that they really can control except through these you know, switches and all that. Um, so it depends how much radioactivity we're using, and, um, but we always try to, uh, safety is paramount at the laboratory. And we also have another acronym I'll share with you. ALARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable. So you only work with the least amount of material that you have to in your job. You don't go looking for exposing yourself to large amount. Oh, oh, you got it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, how did you first like, get interested in physics? Because I know that physics to be, or chemistry to be exact. Oh, um, <laughs> so. When I, I, when I went to high school, I got interested in chemistry in general, which is amazing because my teacher was really bad, but I still got interested in it for some reason. And um, so I went to Berkeley, and with the intent of, and in my, and in my head, a chemist is sort of, you know, what I would call, you know, beaker clinking, like where, you know, like in the movies, right? Blue solution, yellow solution, green solution. And it is obviously that, and, and there's a lot of that, you know, kind of chemistry. Um, but what I learned very quickly is if you're doing that kind of chemistry, you have to have a really awesome memory, and I don't. I was much better at puzzling things out, so I kind of gravitated to what we call physical chemistry, which incorporates a lot of different things. But I was very fortunate that because I was at Berkeley and they have a long history of nuclear chemistry there, the, the professors would teach elements of nuclear chemistry in the, in the general chemistry classes. And so when I heard that, I don't know, for, for me it, it, it became, not that I wanted to mix, you know, blue and yellow liquids together, but it's that I wanted to mash nuclei together and make new, still make new things, but do it with nuclei. And so, um, you know, got my, got my degree in chemistry and realized that the only way to really do what I wanted to do is I had to go back to school and go to graduate school uh, for a PhD. And I actually was fortunate that I could stay at Berkeley and uh, worked for a fantastic professor, Dr. Darlene Hoffman, who um, taught us about uh, nuclear reactions of all kinds, um, looking for new, everything from looking for new isotopes to studying fission. My thesis was on a type of delayed fission and I studied new isotopes. I know that, you know, eight bucks gets you Starbucks, but it was very cool at the time. Um, and also she taught us how to do what we call radiochemistry, which is really that bench top wet chemistry, but with radioactive materials. So what Marie and Pierre Curie were doing when they were discovering all those elements, that's today we would classify as radiochemistry, really doing wet chemistry with radioactive materials. Uh, so I was fortunate that I could do all that stuff and um, was very glad. And then right at the time I finished my PhD, the job market um, tanked. <laughs> and so it was really, and where the money was at that time, was actually in uh, waste disposal. So this is when now the country was realizing there was a lot of waste at nuclear power plants that they weren't treating very well. And so I switched gears and I went into environmental radiochemistry, which was studying how plutonium interacts in the environment and how do we contain it and how do we keep it safe. Um, after that, I then came to Livermore Lab and they had the heavy element uh, program going on. I was really fortunate that I was able to join that and kind of get back into the, the game of smashing things together. Um, so there's my, there's my short-winded life story for you. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shaughnessy, for this presentation, for sharing your time with us. And uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, Have a good evening. Thank you.